But wait, there's more. Menopause Mysteries Prequel. Written by Morgana Best. Narrated by Amy Soakes. Chapter 1 This is the story of how I became a cat. Most people do not become cats, but I was never like most people. Even more so now that I do my private business in a litter tray. It all started the day I hit menopause. There are 34 symptoms of menopause. 34. Let that sink in for an hour or two. Headaches. Night sweats. Irregular periods. Mood swings. That morning, my mouth burnt like I'd sucked on a battery. Don't ask me how I knew what sucking on a battery was like. And my breasts hurt like I'd chest bumped a sumo wrestler. And the worst part? My hot flashes were triggered by caffeine and alcohol, which meant I had to abstain from my two major food groups. I decided then and there, as I stood in my kitchen peering down at an empty coffee mug, that there was no God. Or there was a God and he hated me. I said he because no woman could do this to her sisters. Is my breakfast ready? James asked. James was my husband. Once upon a time I had loved James. He was clean. That was the first thing I thought when I saw him. Clean. He smelt like sandalwood and moss and things that lived deep in the Australian bush. And because I was young, and because I wanted to escape from my family, I married him in a little chapel by the sea. Ever since I said, I do, I've said I do to taking out the rubbish, stacking the firewood, cleaning the bathroom, the kitchen, and everything else, cooking, mending clothes, buying snacks for James's poker nights, buying snacks for James's non-poker nights, turning a blind eye when James sneaked out to visit his mistress, turning the other eye when James sneaked out to visit his other mistress. Much like menopausal symptoms, the list went on. No, I said. No. James appeared in the doorway. He was still handsome, which was infuriating. I'd gone all pale and grey and squishy, while he'd sharpened into a man who could spark envy in George Clooney. Tall, dark, with a silver speckled beard and the same blue eyes that had made me act stupid and giddy as a 21-year-old clerical assistant. No, I replied. In 30 years of marriage, I'd never forgotten his breakfast. You said I had to rearrange the Christmas scenes. The previous morning, I had arranged myrrh, frankincense, and stones I'd painted gold in the nativity scene next to the Christmas tree. James had insisted the myrrh had made him sneeze. James didn't look angry. James never looked angry. It wasn't his style. Instead, he moped. He muttered. He sighed. He ignored me when I asked a question, and he ranted at me when I pointedly did not ask a question. He forgot to invite me to friends' barbecues and didn't forget to invite me to his boss's work functions, which were boring and featured a bunch of men talking about football while the wives were expected to stay in the kitchen. Wait, I said, too on edge for whatever reason that morning to deal with any more of my husband's passive aggressiveness. I touched his hand and he flew back in shock. James flew across the room and he landed against the fridge. The hideous fake potted plant he had bought for me last Christmas shattered as James collapsed onto the floor, blue sparks flying off his hair. James stood up and dusted himself off. The static in this house is insane. This always surprised me, his inability to stir up any sort of intense emotion in himself. If someone had sent me shooting across the kitchen, I would have been furious. Yes, I said, looking at my hands. I didn't think static had anything to do with what had just happened. But what had just happened? Surely I didn't think I had developed superpowers. I'm going to the bookstore. Goodbye.
James said with a shrug. I knew he wouldn't clean up, but at that point, I didn't want to stick around to vacuum. I needed fresh air. It was finally raining on Dingo Mountain. Months of drought hadn't robbed the town of its green, but I did have to order a whole tank of water the day before, so of course it was raining now. I pulled off my sodden coat as I slipped into the bookstore. A likely story was a local celebrity bookstore in our little town in Queensland, Australia. The New Zealand Prime Minister had stopped in there on her tour of our country, and at least two of the three Hemsworth brothers had brought their children. A likely story was run by a man named Edison Chester. He was small and round and kind, with a pink nose and no hair, save for the hair that was growing out of his nose and his long white beard. He greeted everyone the same, with a smile, and he either directed them to the cafe, which served the best coffee on the mountain, or to the book section of the store, which served the best rare books. I never bought a book. My husband wouldn't spare the money, but Edison didn't mind if I sat in my favourite nook, the one near the window with the big armchair, and paged through whatever took my fancy. I travelled the world from the comfort of that nook, exploring chocolate factories with Charlie, and moving objects with my mind with Matilda Wormwood. It didn't matter that these were children's books, or that I wasn't actually exploring or moving anything. Except I had moved something, someone, with my mind that morning, hadn't I? There you are! Agatha grabbed me by the elbow and dragged me into the cafe where we took our usual seats. Agatha Jones was tall and thin and dressed like a starlet from the forties. I didn't know why she hung around with dumpy old me, but I wasn't about to ask. I liked Agatha. I liked her sharpness. I liked her lack of care for the opinions of others. Do you know what happened to me just now, Agatha? I asked after we had our coffees. Agatha placed a hand over her heart and looked at me with rapt attention. No. I gave him an electric shock. James, an electric shock? I zapped him, like I was a taser. Agatha thought for a moment. But that's not uncommon, Jennifer. When I started to go through menopause, my doctor told me that due to the changes going on in my body, I might notice more electric shocks. But I wasn't the one shocked, I replied. James was. That is strange, Agatha paused, holding her cup in front of her mouth. That is very strange indeed. I scratched the back of my neck. That was another symptom, itchiness. You don't think something is happening to me, do you? Something strange? It happens to all of us eventually. I'm not talking about menopause. I'm talking about, well, I don't know what I'm talking about. But I feel different. That's perfectly normal. I'm dizzy. Yes. Bloated. Naturally. And I can move things with my mind. Agatha placed her teacup in the saucer. Say again. This morning I was thinking about Captain Wentworth. From Jane Austen's persuasion? Yes, from Jane Austen's persuasion. And the book flew off the shelf and landed in my lap. Maybe you're anxious. You need to take an Epsom salts bath. I think I'm developing telekinesis. Oh, Agatha replied. I'm sure your bone density is just fine, Jennifer. Just be sure to look after yourself with nutrient-rich foods and vitamins. Not osteoporosis, Agatha. Telekinesis. The ability to move objects with one's mind. Isn't going mad also a symptom of menopause? Agatha said then. Only according to men. You cannot move objects with your mind, Jennifer. Then what about Captain Wentworth? I don't know. It's a bit strange, don't you think? I hit menopause and I start shocking my husband and moving books across the room. Do it again. My husband isn't here. No, 
know, Agatha said. Move a book, any book. I'm not sure I can do it intentionally. Agatha raised her perfectly bladed eyebrows. That's convenient. Fine, don't believe me. I'm sorry, Jennifer. Menopause is a scary time for any woman. Your body is changing in a drastic way. I understand why you're having these delusions. Delusions? Uh, these thoughts. Right. I'll tell you what. Agatha unzipped her purse. Why don't I treat us to a nice big breakfast? I'll order, and while we're waiting for the food, you can have another cup of coffee. That will help calm your nerves. Oh, don't leave me alone, Agatha. I feel all shaken up. Suddenly I felt foolish for asking. I knew I had sounded desperate, but I was desperate, wasn't I? Desperate to know I wasn't mad. Desperate to know how I had sent James rocketing across our kitchen that morning. I didn't take up Agatha's offer of breakfast. Instead, I pulled on my coat, now dry, and walked home, shivering beneath my old umbrella. While Christmas fell in summer in Australia, it was often cold and wet on the mountain. I figured James had gone to work, even though it was a Saturday, because the man loved to do nothing more than potter around with cars at the garage. He was a mechanic, and a brilliant one at that, apparently. Someone was always stopping me to tell me as much. James, I said as I opened the front door. I was not expecting a response. Jennifer? I froze. My husband sounded strange, tight. Aren't you heading into the garage today? Jennifer, I thought you were at the bookstore. His voice held horror. I feel all shaken up this morning. Are you all right? I'm fine. His voice was definitely tight. I stepped forward hesitantly, and I placed my keys and umbrella on the kitchen table. James, are you alone? He didn't reply. I slipped off my coat and placed it next to the keys and the umbrella. James, I said again. I heard a scramble and a thud. I opened the kitchen blind and looked into the garden, only to see a naked woman running through my rose bushes. Well, the poor thing was going to leave the cottage with her legs all scratched up from the thorns. Was that your mistress? I asked, because of course James had a mistress. We had not been intimate for ages, and he was, after all, a red-blooded man. He had told me as much when I had caught him cheating with my best friend two weeks before our wedding. Then I had been so desperate to save face in front of my mother that I had gone through with the marriage. But my mother was gone now, had died ten years ago, and yet I was still married and miserable. And maybe I didn't have to be either. Maybe I could be single and happy. The thought had never occurred to me until I stood in that kitchen among the shards and leaves of a broken, fake potted plant, watching a naked woman run down the road. I can explain, James said. He reached into the cookie jar and popped a sizable cookie into his mouth. Would you boil the jug? I replied. He swallowed loudly. Uh, would I boil the jug? Yes. I'd like a nice cup of tea while we discuss our divorce. He scratched his arm. Jennifer, it doesn't mean anything to me. What doesn't mean anything to you? Her. His face flushed as red as the belly on a venomous red-bellied black snake. And she is? He coughed. Luella. Oh, the cow who works at the supermarket, I said. I had never called anyone names. It felt delightful. Well, I expect that's why she always overcharges me for pears. And apples. And apples, yes, James, thank you. Let's not do anything hasty. I'd like a bagel too, if you wouldn't mind running to the bakery. I patted my stomach. I hadn't eaten carbs in 15 years, and just look where that had got me. Make that seven bagels. Jennifer. 
James raked a hand through his beautiful hair. Well, I said, you had better get dressed and get going. Bagels do not fetch themselves. His mouth dropped open. I, are you, you're not serious about a divorce, are you? You can't throw away everything we have over one mistake. I thought for a moment. Do you think I have developed superpowers? James looked at me in disbelief. Then he said in a voice as confused as it was quiet. Menopause, it really does send women mad. And then he dropped dead. Chapter Two For a moment I stood there, frozen to the spot. It seemed so surreal. I bent down and felt for a pulse, but there wasn't one. I wasn't surprised. Somehow I knew he was gone. In a robotic manner, I opened my handbag, pulled out my phone, and called Triple O. Later, I couldn't remember what I'd said, but a calming female voice told me an ambulance was on its way. The ambulance station was less than ten minutes from my house, and the paramedics turned up precisely ten minutes later. I waited in the garden, stroking the neighbor's cat. Had James had a heart attack, or maybe a sudden stroke? A paramedic walked out and patted me on my arm. Mrs. Smothering, she said in soothing tones, is there somebody I can call? Call, I repeated. What do you mean? A friend, a relative. I see, I nodded slowly. Is he dead? I'm afraid so. What was his medical history? I don't know. He didn't have a medical history as far as I know. Was he taking any medication? I don't think so. But then again, James and I weren't close. He was naked. Had he just finished exercising hard? I shrugged. Maybe. I just caught him with his mistress. Do you think it was a heart attack? Then I remembered. Oh, James had a peanut allergy. He did have an epinephrine injector, though. You know, for an anaphylactic reaction. The paramedic kept talking, but I didn't really take in what she was saying. I agreed she could call the police, although I didn't realize the police were called to heart attack victims. I nodded at intervals, and maybe they were the wrong intervals, because she took me by my arm again and suggested I call someone. Finally, I gave her Agatha's phone number. I was still in a daze when Agatha arrived. She threw her arms around me in a dramatic fashion. Oh, you poor thing. James is dead. Are you all right? I stared at her. No, of course I'm not all right. My husband has just dropped dead. How will I tell my children? Agatha put her arm around me. Come home with me, she said. Grab some things. Maybe you should stay with me for a few days. After all, you don't want to come back to the house where James... Her voice trailed away. I walked into the house with Agatha. I walked past my cat-shaped teapot. James had always hated that teapot. I walked into the bedroom. Sheets were flung everywhere, as were items of women's clothing. Agatha picked up a black lace bra. This is too small and fancy for you, surely. I sighed. I'll explain it all later. I grabbed an overnight bag and tossed in some clothes. They were shabby clothes, not fashionable in the slightest. James had never allowed me to spend money on clothes, but he was always able to spend plenty of money on his golf clubs and the newest golf fashion. Was it bad to resent somebody who had only just died? Maybe it was the shock. I picked up my little makeup bag and threw in my toothbrush and a tube of toothpaste. Agatha looked as though she was about to suggest I fetch something else, but wisely thought the better of it. Before long, I was sitting in her house by her Christmas tree, sipping a nice hot cup of sugary tea. How awful for your husband to die at Christmas, Agatha said. 
I nodded, but I thought it was bad for somebody to die at any time of the year. Feel free to cry if it would make you feel better. I took a deep breath and told her all about James's affair with the woman from the supermarket. And then I told her about all his other affairs. As I went on, her jaw dropped lower and lower, and her face turned a horrible shade of purple. Jennifer, why didn't you tell me all this before? I shrugged. I was ashamed. Agatha made to protest, but I pushed on. I have to tell my children about James. Agatha stood up and patted my shoulder. I'll give you some privacy. She stormed out of the room, muttering angrily to herself. I called each of my children in turn. Not one of them had an ounce of sympathy for me, and two of them even suggested it was my fault for not making sure James's diet was better. I was past caring. I stood up and walked to the window. When I returned to my chair, one of Agatha's cats was sitting there. I picked her up and put her on my knee. She purred loudly. I wished I were a cat. Cats didn't have a care in the world. Agatha hurried back into the room. I wasn't listening, Jennifer. Well, I was. Not to your words, but to the sound of your voice. Have you told all the kids now? Yes. Wouldn't it be lovely to be a cat? Agatha peered into my face. I expect she thought I was losing my mind. A cat? Yes. Cats have the best lives. They get fed on demand and get plenty of affection. Cats can do whatever they like. Everybody loves cats. When I was a child, I wanted to be a cat. Maybe you need some eggnog, Agatha said. I know it's early in the day, but a bit of Christmas cheer wouldn't go astray. And a slice of Christmas cake with it. I clutched my stomach. I don't feel too well. I don't think I could eat. But eggnog should be fine, I added as an afterthought. I sat there, staring at one of the silver baubles on the Christmas tree. I had been married to James for years. I had only today decided to divorce him. But now he was well and truly gone. What would my life be like now? There was a loud knock on the door, startling the cats. I wasn't expecting anybody, Agatha said as she hurried out of the room. I heard a man's voice at the door. Presently, Agatha returned to the room with a tall, broad-shouldered man, wearing a tight suit and a grim expression. Her face was white and drawn. Mrs. Smothering? Yes, I held Agatha's cat closer to me. My name is Detective Sergeant Wilfred Wigbert, and this is Detective Brock Bentley Blather. We'd like to ask you some questions about the murder of your husband. Chapter Three Murder? I shrieked. James was murdered? Are you sure? But how? The ride to the police station in the back of the detective's car was a blur, as was their questioning. As I emerged hours later from the small brick building, one thing was clear. I was the prime, maybe the only suspect in their murder investigation. James's affairs had somehow been turned against me. I switched on my phone and saw five missed calls from Agatha and as many texts. I didn't want to rehash the police questioning, not right now. So I turned off the phone and asked the taxi to take me to a likely story. Edison Chester greeted me at the front door of the bookstore. I was sorry to hear about your husband, he said in a tone which suggested otherwise. Thanks. I made to push past him, but he laid his hand on my arm. Little silver sparkles leapt into the air. Or had I imagined it? Was losing one's mind a symptom of menopause, as James had suggested? Women come into their power at this time, Edison continued, nodding sagely as he spoke. What time was that? I looked at my watch. The heavy, unattractive watch irritated me, clamping around my wrist, holding it prisoner. 
It had been a gift from James, and he had always insisted I wear it daily. The item reminded me of a handcuff, of being chained to James. Now I ripped it off and stood there turning it over in my hands. Who needs an old watch when they have a smartphone? I asked myself. Edison was watching me. No, I mean women's time. He waggled his bushy eyebrows. Women's business. Oh, I said, but I didn't have a clue what he meant. Do you have any books on, um, suddenly developing superpowers? I was at once embarrassed, but to my surprise, Edison nodded and indicated I should follow him to a back room. I had not known this room existed. I turned to say so, but Edison had disappeared. I walked in. Golden light filtered through the high, barred windows, casting an eerie glow upon the room. Particles of dust danced in the beams, but the room didn't feel musty. Instead, it felt bright, uplifting somehow. I crossed to the seat directly under the bay window. I looked out of the window to see tourists bustling about. I turned my attention to the room. On the seat was an open book with the headings Spells, Tarot, Crystal Balls. Next to it was a gold-embossed book with the engraved title Witch's Tales. I shut the open book and gasped with delight. Perched on the cover was a raised silver spider, and from it stretched a delicate silver cobweb. I wasn't one for spiders, given the fact in Australia there are two varieties of spiders that can kill you, and one of those varieties is common. Still, the silver work was as pretty as it was intricate. I turned around to peruse the shelves. The first book to catch my eye was Papyri Grecia Magicae, subtitled The Greek Magical Papyri in Translation. I spent a few minutes reading, but it said nothing about moving objects with one's mind. The same could be said for the rest of the books on that shelf. Any other time, I would have loved looking through these books. As it was, my husband had been murdered only hours earlier, and the police suspected me. I had to find out what was happening to me. Was it simply menopause, and I was losing my mind? I flung my hands to the ceiling. What's going on? I asked. I spun around at the sound of a thud. A book had fallen out on the floor all by itself. Did I do that? I asked, but there was nobody around to reply. I picked up the book and crossed over to the seats by the bay window. The title, in fancy gold lettering, was Book of Truths, A History. I made myself comfortable and opened the book. The contents shocked me. It said that a woman's power didn't appear until she started menopause. This applied both to women who possessed paranormal powers and those who did not. In the case of those with paranormal powers, it said a woman could go all her life without a single paranormal ability, but once she hit menopause, paranormal abilities would manifest. That would be me, I exclaimed. I turned the page, my hands shaking with excitement. I wasn't going mad after all. But did paranormal powers actually exist? Or was this a fiction book disguised as a non-fiction book. I had no way of knowing, so I read on. The book said that throughout history, people were suspicious of women who had abilities to heal, whether those natural abilities were helped by the paranormal or not. It said our patriarchal society focused on youth to keep women from knowing that they do step into their powers at a later age. In our society, women of my age were rendered invisible, with all the advertising targeted to the youthful. Yet the book said women over 40 or 50 became truly powerful. I could scarcely believe what I was reading. I shut the book and placed it carefully back on the shelf, and then set off to walk to Agatha's house. It was a long walk, and I was hot and bothered, both from the humidity 
and the hot flashes. What was I thinking? Agatha would have picked me up, but I wanted to be alone with my thoughts. I decided to buy a bottle of cold water from the small cafe on the edge of town. As I stepped onto the road, a tall, thin man on a bicycle swerved to miss me. He yelled insults at me as he sped past. I turned around to shake my fist at him, but he went flying into the air and landed on a low tree branch. Onlookers hurried to help him as his bike skidded down the road. I selected a nice, cold bottle of water from the fridge and handed some change to the obviously bored girl behind the counter. We prefer cards? I noticed a sign on the counter, 2.5% surcharge for cards. I frowned. I've only got cash. She scowled at me and snapped, All right then. She all but snatched the money from me. At once, her apron caught on fire. I unscrewed the lid and threw my bottle of water over her. The shop owner hurried out and thanked me for my fast action. She gave me five cold bottles of water and offered to drive me home. Chapter Four Agatha must have been watching through her window because she flung open the front door as soon as I walked inside her front gate. Jennifer, she shrieked. I've been so worried about you. What happened? If you can give me something full of carbs, I'll tell you, I said. Soon I was back in the comfortable chair by the Christmas tree with a purring cat in my lap. The police think I murdered James. Agatha gasped. I pushed on. Yes, they think I murdered him because he was having affairs. How many affairs did he have exactly? Agatha asked through narrowed eyes. I waved one hand at her. I don't know. I knew he was having some, but I didn't know about Luella. He never mentioned the names of his mistresses to you. I chuckled. Of course not. He always denied everything. Anyway, the police think I only just discovered what he was up to and murdered him. Are they sure he was murdered? Agatha asked. I nodded. Yes, and that's why they think I did it. He ate a cookie full of ground peanuts. Agatha opened her mouth, so I hurried to explain. As you know, James won't risk eating store-bought cookies, so I've been making them for him for years. Agatha nodded slowly. Yes, you keep them in that large glass jar at the end of your kitchen island. I nodded. He ate one just before he died. In hindsight, it did seem as though he was having symptoms, but maybe he was focusing too much on me catching him with Luella and didn't realize. Agatha readily agreed. Of course, he wouldn't have suspected you'd bake him a peanut cookie. But I didn't, I screeched. Of course I didn't. We never had a single peanut in the house. Anyway, the detectives said they confiscated those cookies and my ingredients. Agatha, somebody put a peanut cookie in that jar deliberately. Agatha looked thoughtful. It had to be one of his mistresses. I'm sure the murderer wasn't trying to frame you, Jennifer. Just do away with James. My hand went to my throat. Frame me? What if I need a lawyer? I asked in alarm. Agatha opened her mouth to speak, but I pushed on. Remember how I thought I was going mad? Agatha nodded. Yes, James was quite worried about you. I pulled a face. Well, after the police questioned me at length and I signed my statement, I went to the bookstore. I'd already researched online, of course, but I know that Edison has old, rare books. I thought I might find something that hadn't found its way to the internet. Agatha nodded her encouragement. Oh, yes, women of old probably knew a lot about menopause. These days it seems to be all about chemical and hormonal therapies. That was wise, Jennifer. I held up one hand, palm outwards. No, 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 I wasn't looking for books on menopause. I was looking for books on suddenly developing paranormal powers. Agatha gasped. And I did find a history book that said women become powerful as soon as they reach menopause. 
I don't mean they necessarily have paranormal abilities or anything like that, I hastened to add. But isn't it wonderful? I was starting to feel invisible with all this focus on youth, but now I realise I'm more powerful than I've ever been. Agatha shook her head. I didn't want to say anything with your husband so recently deceased, but you really must face facts, Jennifer. I can't humour you any longer. It seems you could be developing a mental illness, just like your mother and your grandmother before you. I planted my palm onto my forehead. Of course. People thought they had a mental illness, but they didn't. They came into their powers at menopause. The book says it runs in certain bloodlines. Agatha tut-tutted. Really, Jennifer, I'm worried about you. There's no such thing as paranormal powers. That book fell off the shelf, and it was the very one I needed, I protested. And I've told you about other things like that happening to me. The book was right. I think you need some pills, Agatha said sadly. Or maybe it's just the shock of James. She snatched a tissue from the small coffee table near the Christmas tree and dabbed furiously at her eyes. Jennifer, please put this paranormal nonsense behind you. There are more pressing matters, like James's death. You'll have to arrange his funeral. I assume you will inherit everything, although perhaps you'll be sharing it with your children. Oh, yes, the funeral. I bit my lip. Agatha, who could have possibly murdered James? I mean, he was a mechanic. It's not as though he was a high-powered businessman or a spy. I think you're right. I think one of his mistresses murdered him. Did you tell the detectives that? Agatha asked me. No. Um, yes, I think I did. It was all very stressful. Anyway, I'm sure they'd be looking into all his mistresses as well. Especially Luella, who left the house just before he died. I wish I knew who the murderer was. A surge of energy shot through me. Just then, an urn containing the ashes of one of Agatha's former husbands fell from the ornate cedar mantelpiece and smashed onto the floor. Chapter 5 I couldn't remember what drinks the children liked, and I couldn't remember if I was allowed to drink in front of them. For a little while, my youngest daughter Katie decided that it was undignified for a woman of my age to indulge in... Well, to indulge. She'd smack liqueur chocolates out of my hands. She'd pour my wine down the sink. She'd give my pims to the neighbours. All because one time I'd had a few too many red wines and went into a bar to have some fun on a mechanical bull. Sue me. I spent the morning carefully wrapping my cat ornaments in bubble wrap, and I spent the afternoon carefully burying the cats in the backyard to keep them safe, intending to retrieve them after the kids left. I knew my oldest son, Henry, and his evil wife, Beatrix, were just itching to get rid of my figurines. Henry had once been my favourite. I know you are not supposed to have favourites, but still. A sweet little boy with blonde curls and damp blue eyes. He'd gone from inserting himself under my arm at night to rolling his eyes whenever I walked into the room. Then there was Carol Angel. A terrible name, Carol Angel. She was born on Christmas Day, and I had wanted to call her Noel or Clara. James did not like either of those names. He found them flighty, whatever that meant. At first, I refused to name her Carol Angel. I was steadfast, stoic, determined. But his family arrived in town and agreed with James. And when I was asleep, his mother filled out the forms and James signed them and everything was done before I had the chance to stop them. It was unbelievable how little agency people gave to mothers. It's not like Carol Angel was the daughter I carried and delivered. No, why should I get a say in her name? Henry, Carol Angel, and Katie. I'd gone mad raising them alone. 
James spent all his time at work, and he didn't think the children should spend any time at childcare, given that they might pick up germs or bad manners. That was easy for him to say, seeing as he wasn't the one at home reading Spot the Dog over and over for hours on end, day after day. Katie, Henry, Evil Beatrix, and Carol Angel. If those were the only guests arriving at my cottage that afternoon, then maybe I wouldn't have needed to bury my precious cat ornaments in the backyard. Then maybe I could have tucked them away in the cupboard and hoped for the best. Alas, James had wanted a big family. He saw it as a status symbol. Like, hello world, I can afford to pay for eight mouths to feed. Except James couldn't pay for eight mouths to feed, and it was often me who missed out. It was me who missed out on going out with my friends. It was me who missed out on holidays to New Zealand. James told me that he was doing me a favour by giving me so many children. And he was. But perhaps I would have liked to explore volcanoes, even if that meant holding Henry's hand while doing so. After all, I held his hand at home, on the way to school, in the supermarket. Why should I not have any fun in life? After Carol Angel came Murgatroyd. Yes, James forced me to name our second-born son Murgatroyd, because why name him something cute when you can name him something terrible? Carol Angel and Murgatroyd found themselves in classrooms positively overflowing with boys named Christopher and girls named Sarah. And do you know the awful part? When Murgatroyd asked his father why we had called him Murgatroyd, James had replied, Your mother chose the name. Your mother? Me? Choose the name Murgatroyd? Apparently, Murgatroyd was the name of some long-dead cousin on James's mother's side. I bet he died of shame. You are such a name, snob, Agatha once told me, and she was correct. I loved thinking about names. After Murgatroyd, we had Bertha. Bertha was named after a cow my husband used to pat on his way to school. She was kind, this Bertha, and swished her tail as he scratched her behind the ears. Apparently, this was the highlight of his childhood. And how could I possibly deny him the nostalgia high of calling our daughter Bertha? His family made a big song and dance about how selfish I was, and by then, I had just stopped caring. If his family insisted on choosing names, then so be it. The kids could change their names when they were older, I told myself. And Bertha, in fact, did. As soon as she turned 18, she had me drive her to the city, where we filled out the appropriate forms and showed the appropriate identification. Bertha was now Lavender. But she didn't just stop with changing her first name. No, she changed her last name too. She was now Lavender Crew, named after the hero of A Little Princess. I'd loved that book, and Lavender had inherited that love. We'd been close once as well, just like I was once close with Henry. I don't know how their father poisoned them against me, but he did. He turned them from my babies into adults who could barely stand to be in the same room as I, who spoke down to me and rolled their eyes and scoffed and snorted and elbowed each other in the ribs when I gave any sort of suggestion or advice. And now they were visiting me tonight, and they were going to judge and belittle and snark. Didn't Dad want to paint the house? Henry said as he arrived. No, I replied. I wanted to paint the house. Henry frowned at me. I don't know why you protested. It could do with a new coat of paint. Your father protested. He said it would cost too much. Beatrix, don't you think the house needs a new coat of paint? Henry turned to his wife, who was tall and slim, with short black hair and a large gap between her teeth. I don't know why your mother refused, she replied. I didn't. I snapped, but there was no talking to them. Poor Dad, 
Lavender said when she arrived. Having to live in such a grim little cottage. I live here too, I replied, trying to keep the bitterness out of my voice. Please tell me all those ugly little cat figurines you like are gone, Katie said when she arrived. Carol Angel agreed with her. Oh, those were hideous. They had arrived together, leaving their husbands at home with their children, whom they believed were better raised than I had been able to manage with them. Always so judgmental, these children of mine. To think they were all once so adorable. I suppose they hadn't sprouted tusks or devil horns. To the emotionally uninvested stranger, they probably seemed perfectly normal. I brought food, Murgatroyd said the moment he stepped from his car. We all know what mum is like with cooking. We do, I said, as all the children nodded in agreement with Murgatroyd. Dinner was horrible. Murgatroyd had brought bread and cold cuts. I thought of the dinner I had prepared. Goat's cheese mini tarts, seven layer chicken Caesar salad, prosciutto wrapped halloumi sticks, and salmon strips with saffron mayonnaise. In fact, I'd spent the last of my money for the month on the goat's cheese and salmon. Neither were cheap. To think of all that food going to waste because my children thought bread and cold cuts were tastier than anything I could cook. That was delicious, Lavender told Murgatroyd, much better than anything I expected to eat. Everyone agreed. I wanted to tell them all to shove off, but Katie and Carol Angel had decided to poke through everything James and I owned. We should sell this, Carol Angel said, picking up a porcelain doll that belonged to my mother. It's creepy. Yes, it was creepy, but it also had sentimental value, and it was not in the least bit cursed, which was surprising when you think about it. It's not going anywhere, I said, snatching the doll away. Oh, Mum, Lavender said, please be reasonable. Dad hated that doll. Your father is dead, I said, which made each and every one of my children gasp. Evil Beatrix gave Henry a look which said, I told you your mother is an uncaring monster. We need to sell the bed in the master bedroom, Beatrix said. It's far too big for one person. Your mother will get by just fine sleeping in a single bed. I was stunned. Excuse me? Beatrix continued as though I were not there. One of us really should move in with her, just to keep an eye on her health. She'll not be able to manage alone, you know. Actually, Lavender said, I think we should sell the house now that Dad is gone and put Mum in a nursing home. Excuse me, I shrieked. This is my house now. The kids disagreed. Dad left everything to us in his will, they all said in unison. You are over 50 now, Mum, Lavender added. You really do need to move into a nursing home. You can't expect us to look after you in your advanced age. Jennifer Lopez is older than I am, I snapped. Are you all planning on selling her house and sticking her in a home? Do you need to lie down, Henry said. Do I need to teach you all manners, I retorted. This is my house until the will is settled, and I'll thank you for keeping your sticky fingers off the things which are mine. Now, if you'll excuse me, I plan on standing in front of the fridge and stuffing my face with goat's cheese. Murgatroyd tut tutted. You really do need to lose some weight, Mum. People who have obesity are at increased risk for so many diseases and health conditions, like hypertension and type 2 diabetes. And coronary heart disease, Beatrix added. Not to mention sleep apnea, Lavender said. And clinical depression, Carol Angel added. I am not obese, I snapped. The children all looked at each other like I was senile. The nursing home probably has some sort of dietary requirements that mum will need to follow, Lavender said to Carol Angel and Katie. That should help get her back on track. Yes, Carol Angel said. 
But does Mum have the willpower to follow a diet? I'm sorry, but I think we need to send her to rehab. I could use a drink, come to think of it, I muttered to myself. Not with your alcohol addiction, Beatrix said, which, yes, does need addressing. No, we need to sort out your dependence on food. It's not healthy. It's not healthy to eat, I said. You binge eat. When have I ever... Mom, you are constantly standing in front of the fridge where you stuff your mouth with goat's cheese. You just admitted to that two seconds ago. I did nothing of the sort. Oh, she's now losing her memory, Beatrix said, and she sighed. It's terrible what age does to somebody. Obesity is a risk factor for Alzheimer's, Carol Angel said sadly. Terrible, terrible disease. I think Mama's fine, Murgatroyd said. Finally, an ally. Thank you, I replied. Murgatroyd shook his head. You didn't let me finish. I think Mum is fine to go into a nursing home. Think of all the fun she could have with all the other old people. My girlfriend's grandmother is in a nursing home. She gets ice cream every Sunday evening. Doesn't that sound nice, Mum? Ice cream every Sunday evening? I didn't tell Murgatroyd that I could eat ice cream every Sunday evening if I wanted now, that I didn't need to be in an old people prison in order to eat ice cream. Shove off, I said. Henry, Katie, Carol Angel, Murgatroyd and Lavender all looked at me in shock. Mum, Henry said. I gave them all the finger, stuck out my tongue and climbed out the window. Chapter Six I'm never going back to that house again. I burst into tears and stuck my face in front of Agatha's air conditioner. Agatha picked up a magazine and fanned me. I'm terribly sorry that James's death kicked you out of your own home. Why don't you contest the will? I reached for the remote control and set the air conditioner to its coldest setting. I can't do that. I can't take my own children to court. They don't care about you, Agatha snapped. Where do they expect you to live? I don't think they care, to be honest. They said they're going to sell the house. I'll have to get a job and rent a small apartment somewhere in town. Maybe Edison Chester could give me a job. The hot flash had passed, so I turned the air conditioner back to its usual setting. I crossed the room to sit next to the Christmas tree. I don't think he has enough business to give anybody a job, Agatha said, but I'm sure somebody in town would be happy to give a job to a local. I threw up my hands to the ceiling. I don't have any skills. My only skills are sleeping and eating, like a cat. I broke off and uttered a rueful laugh. Nonsense, Agatha said firmly. You looked after James for years. You waited on him hand and foot. Yes, I did. I pulled a Christmas ornament out of the tree and spun it so it reflected the light. You're welcome to stay here until you find a job and get on your feet, Agatha said. I thanked her. That's very kind. It's the least I can do. Her expression was grim. Have you heard from the police again? I shook my head. No, thank goodness. Obviously the murderer didn't plant any peanut substances in my baking ingredients. I'm sure the murderer didn't want to frame you, Agatha said brusquely. I wonder if the police have arrested Luella. I continued to shake my head. No, it would be all over town by now if they had. Anyway, I'm never going to that supermarket again. Agatha nodded solemnly. I don't blame you. When will you start looking for a job? Today, I told her. People might need extra help, what with Christmas and everything. Agatha agreed. You could try waitressing. Plus, some of the smaller specialty stores would need more help. Maybe the health food store or the cakery. You're a very good cook. 
I don't have any qualifications in anything, I told her, and they can pay younger people really cheap wages. I'll ask around for you. While I was shy and introverted, Agatha was quite the opposite. She went to the local gym daily and was as fit as someone half her age. She was strong and wiry, and as well as being interested in physical fitness, was a member of the local theatre group, the local land care group, the local bushwalking group, and many other groups whose names I couldn't remember. She knew everybody in town. Agatha grabbed her iPad. I know, you could put a job wanted ad in the local Facebook community group. My hand flew to my mouth. What if they think I was the murderer? What if people think I murdered James and they will be afraid to have me working for them? I don't think anyone thinks that, Agatha said indifferently. And if the police thought that, they would have taken you back in for questioning. They're more likely to be suspicious of Luella, considering she was the last person to see him alive. Actually, I was, I corrected her. Agatha waved one hand at me in dismissal. You know what I mean. We were having coffee together and you went back home unexpectedly. Luella and James clearly weren't expecting you. The police will realise that. She had plenty of opportunity to pop the peanut cookies into the cookie jar. I rubbed my forehead. It's all too much to take in. It's bad enough that James is dead, but being murdered, it's all too much. Agatha walked over and placed her hand on my shoulder. It's a horrible shock. You're better off without him. I agreed with her, but I didn't think it a polite thing to say. Still, Agatha was nothing if not blunt. Here, you could help me decorate the Christmas tree to take your mind off things. I looked at the Christmas tree. It already seemed very well decorated. Every spare bit of green was entirely covered with Christmas decorations. Santas sitting on trains, ceramic reindeer, pink velvet rhinestone reindeer, Santas hanging from parachutes. On the top of the tree sat a huge sparkling silver star. Agatha, being wealthy, had the most superb Christmas decorations, whereas I had made paper chains and had tied green and red ribbons around bits of lavender from the garden. James had given me a tiny budget for the Christmas decorations. I said as much to Agatha. He was certainly a stingy man. Look, Jennifer, I know you don't like me saying it, but you really are better off without him. I mean, you've been a grown woman all these years, and he gave you a tight household budget. I nodded. I had to ask him if I wanted to buy anything. He wouldn't even let me go to the hairdresser to get my hair coloured. My hand went to my hair, which was a horrible monotone shade of dark brown. I always bought the cheapest one in the packet from the supermarket. I'm going to let my hair grow back to its natural colour. Agatha leant forward. What is your natural colour? It's probably all grey now. I stopped speaking and sighed deeply. But it was red. When I met James, I had flame red hair, but he said it was a horrible colour and insisted I colour it brown. I've been colouring it brown for all these years just to please him. Now you can do whatever you like, Agatha said brightly. You don't have to worry about James's tight budgets or James and his silly allergies like peanuts and myrrh. I didn't think peanuts counted as a silly allergy, considering a peanut allergy was life-threatening, and, in fact, had killed James. As for the myrrh, I frowned hard. Myrrh? I repeated. I looked at Agatha, who had stopped speaking and was licking her lips in a nervous manner. She reminded me of a snake. I had only set the myrrh in the nativity scene the morning before James was killed. Agatha hadn't seen James for at least a week before that when I had invited her to dinner with us. How would she know about the myrrh? That is, unless, as I watched, Agatha's face drained of all colour. She looked away at the coffee table. I looked too, 
at the large pair of scissors lying there. Agatha lunged for the scissors. I jumped to my feet and sprinted into the first room I could find, with Agatha hard on my heels. I spun around and bolted the door, just in time. I looked around the room. It was a pantry, a tiny pantry. There was not so much as a high window. The only way out was through that door, the door I had just bolted. My mobile phone was in my handbag, out by the chair. If I screamed, nobody would hear me. Agatha would get through that door one way or another. She had an open fireplace and was used to chopping her own wood. She owned a wood splitter. I decided to try to reason with her, but before I could speak, her strident voice came through the door. The myrrh gave me away, didn't it? Yes, I admitted. I knew you couldn't have known about it. Not unless James told you. But why? Why? It dawned on me nanoseconds before she spoke. I was having an affair with James, too. He told me he was going to leave you and marry me. Yet only a few days ago, he told me his children would be embarrassed if he got a divorce. I didn't know what to say. I stood there, trembling, my heart beating out of my chest. I won't tell anyone, I croaked. Agatha laughed, a dry, cackling laugh. I can't take that risk, Jennifer. But if you murder me, the police will know it was you. It won't look good, first James and then me. I don't have a choice. I'll throw your body down at the bottom of Cedar Falls. But there will be DNA evidence, I protested. I had no idea if that was true, since I didn't like watching gripping murder thrillers on TV. I only liked watching happy shows, nice mysteries where only mean people died and the others lived happily ever after. I know what I'm doing, Agatha said. James isn't the first person I murdered. I murdered two of my past three husbands. Where do you think all my money came from? I sank to the floor. Was this really the end? There were no weapons in the pantry, nothing I could use as a weapon. Sheer panic overwhelmed me, so much so that my head began to clear. The Book of Truths. Was I really coming into my powers? Could I use magical powers to save myself? I tried to will a can of diced pineapple to fall off the shelves. Nothing happened. I tried to think of the other books I had read in the bookstore. The books had said success came in manifesting what one truly desired. It was all to do with focus. Maybe I didn't really care about the can of pineapple falling off the shelf. What did I desire most in the world at that moment? I shut my eyes tightly. James had always told me not to squint because it would give me more wrinkles. I shut my eyes even more tightly and focused. Let what I truly desire most in the world happen to me right now, I said. I focused hard and willed it so. I could hear Agatha's heavy footsteps returning. I hadn't even realized she left. This was it. I focused harder and harder until everything around me, the air, the sounds, nature itself stilled. Behind me came the sound of a wood splitter knocking the handle off the door. The door flew open. I've got you, Agatha screeched as she burst into the room. Meow, I said as I brushed past her ankles and fled. Chapter 7 No one teaches you anything of use in high school. I was forced to do home science with the girls, and even though the sewing skills I picked up fared me well eventually, I wanted to build birdhouses with the boys in woodwork, and so did most of the other girls in my class. I was also forced to do English and maths and French and chemistry, and nothing I picked up in any of those classes prepared me for life as a cat. A cat. I was now a cat. I didn't know what perplexed me more, 
the fact I had a tail, or the fact my tail didn't bother me at all. In fact, I instantly loved being a cat. I loved the feel of my body, which was now strong and agile. I managed to jump on top of the rubbish bins and then jump on top of the roof without hurting my knees and finding my lungs begging for air. I loved the smell of garbage, which had always bothered me before, and I loved doing my business in the dirt, a pleasure humans didn't seem to indulge in all that often. I did find myself concerned about the lack of thumbs, specifically my lack of thumbs. How could I open cans of tuna? How could I rip open packets of chicken? No, I needed a human to help, and I knew exactly which human to choose. His name was Edison, and he worked in a bookshop. I padded along various roofs until I reached the bookstore, and there I slipped in through the cat door. Yes, the bookstore had a cat door, and a rug, and a warm fire. In fact, I forgot all about Edison and found myself sprawled on my back, the heat from the fire so warm and pleasant on my stomach. My stomach? I didn't have to care about fat rolls anymore. I didn't have to care about looking pregnant when I stuffed myself like a fat sausage into one of the dresses I'd bought ten years ago and promised myself I would wear to one of my daughter's functions. And my children. I didn't have to pretend I liked my children anymore. Yes, I loved them, but they were raging jerks, and I couldn't be bothered with them. With their eye rolls, with their snorts. They could go and belittle their mothers-in-law and spend the rest of their lives wondering to where their real mother had vanished. I was mean as a cat, and I loved it. I also didn't have to worry about my cat figurines, because I was now a cat. Come to think of it, I hadn't dug them up from my garden. Some archaeologist would find them in a thousand years, and believe a cat-worshipping society lived on that very spot. That maybe a cat-worshipping Australian queen was buried amongst those little figurines. Suddenly, I heard a bang, and I remembered. Food. I wanted food, and quick. I padded into the cafe, where Edison was sweeping the crumbs off the floor. Meow, I said. Meow. Hello, are you hungry? Edison replied. No, I thought. I am meowing just for kicks. Yes, I am hungry. Feed me now, or I will meow at you until you go mad. Are you hungry? Edison said again. Meow? Should I get you something to eat? Meow? I ran in front of his feet, just because that seemed like the thing to do. Meow? All right, all right. Edison opened the fridge. Soon I was scoffing down chicken tenders. I purred as I ate, loving the vibration through my body. I read once that purring had long been associated with the therapeutic healing of bones and muscle in humans. I was practically a superhero. This was the life. Free food, free rent. I didn't have to call the bank anymore to ask for an extension on the mortgage. I didn't have to go to the dentist. I didn't have to make small talk. I could purr and heal bones and eat other people's food. Why hadn't I become a cat a long time ago? When I had finished eating, I found a mirror, just so I could take a good look at myself. I was Ginger, a ginger cat, a beautiful ginger cat. No wonder Edison fed me the moment I asked. Who could resist this cute ball of orange fluff? I was going to get so many pats. I was going to get so many scratches under my ear. I was going to be so loved, finally. Now I just had to settle the housing situation. Meow, I said to Edison. Meow. Who do you belong to then? Meow. Maybe you should stay here for a bit, Edison said. And tomorrow we'll get you checked at the vets for a microchip. If no one owns you, you are free to stay. 
Microchip? Oh no, I would have to go to the vet who would stick a thermometer up my bottom. Well, thermometers up bottoms were a small price to pay for living the life. Edison appeared to reconsider. You look familiar. I won't take you to the vet, he said now. You can stay here. Meow, I agreed, and I didn't stick around for him to change his mind. I padded back to the fire, where I threw up behind a potted plant, and then sprawled on the rug again. Edison found the mess and cleaned it up quickly, which shocked me to my feline core. I was the one who cleaned up messes. That was my job. Sometimes it felt as though I spent half my life cleaning up other people's messes. And now I didn't have to any longer. I lay in front of the fire for the next 11 hours, but jumped up when I had an awful thought. Edison had been so kind to let me stay here, yet I had not given him anything in return. He needed a gift, something he could eat, perhaps. In truth, I did not trust him to feed himself. No, he needed my help. So I found a rat, killed it, and put it in his slipper. He couldn't possibly miss a dead rat in his slipper, and he would be so thankful for my gift that he would use his thumbs to open tins of tuna for me. I was a feline genius. Ugh! Edison screamed an hour later when he put his feet in his slippers, and I rubbed against his ankles as if to say, you are so welcome. What on earth? Edison said. Meow, I agreed. I really was the best cat in the whole entire world. I thought about lying in front of the fire again, but Edison had opened his laptop. I suspected he was Googling ways to thank your cat for the gifts they put in your slippers, but I needed no such thanks. So I decided to sit on Edison's laptop, right there on the keys. <sighs> Edison said again, and I purred happily. But I was not to sit for long, no, Edison needed exercise. Yes, it was now 11 at night, but fitness would wait for no bookshop owner. I jumped off the laptop and sprinted over to the door, where I scratched and scratched and scratched. All right, Edison said, I will let you out. Meow, I said, but when he opened the door, I simply looked out into the vast darkness. Are you going out or not? Meow. I said again, but I did not move. Edison huffed, and he closed the door. Fine, stay inside. I'm going to bed. But when Edison left the room, I scratched on the door again. Really, it was for his own benefit. He needed to get the blood pumping in those legs, and he needed to get fresh air into his lungs. So you do want to go outside after all, Edison said when he returned to the room. He opened the door once more, but again, I just stood there, staring out into the darkness. Why are you doing this? Edison said. Meow. Edison slammed the door shut. Do not scratch on this door one more time. Gee, I thought, I am trying to help the man. Maybe he needs another rat in his slipper. Yes, that will cheer him up but rats in slippers would have to wait. First, I had to knock every single vase and photo frame off the bookshelves. Then I had to scratch up the couch that looked new, because people would steal a mint condition couch, but they would not steal a scratched couch, and I doubted Edison had the insurance to replace stolen items. I don't know how he'd managed before I arrived. Also, I had to slap him in the face as he slept, just to make sure he was still breathing. You could never be sure. So I sat on his pillow the whole entire night, prodding him with my paw until he woke up grumbling, which was my cue to slip out of the room. When he fell asleep again, I jumped back on the bed, prodding him until he woke up. Humans sure were a lot of work. Edison? A man poked his head around the door the moment the bookstore opened the following morning. His name was Francis, and he worked part-time with my husband. I didn't sleep all night, Edison said with a yawn. Agatha Jones murdered James. Edison's mouth dropped open. 
Agatha murdered James? She confessed. No. Francis nodded. Yes, they were having an affair. Apparently she's lost her mind. Says she saw a human turn into a cat. Couldn't confess fast enough. Well, is Jennifer all right? She's gone, Francis said. Gone? Edison turned pale and started to shake. Gone where? Fiji, Francis replied. Her children think she's left them and moved to Fiji. They think she's now floating in a clear lagoon while drinking cocktails out of a coconut. It would serve those awful children right, Francis nodded. I never liked him, that James. Wherever Jennifer is now, I hope she is happy. I hope so too, Edison replied. I hope so too. I wished I could tell Edison I was happy for the first time in my life. I wished I could tell him I had solved the murder. I was a feline Jessica Fletcher. I wished I could tell him I felt powerful for the first time. I could run and I could jump. I could sleep all day and run around madly at night. I could sit in shoeboxes and potted plants. I could headbutt people I loved, which is an urge I'd always had but had to keep to myself. Really, I could do my business in the dirt and throw up on the rug and no one would care because I was cute. Wait a moment. I thought, this must be how Kim Kardashian feels. The End This was the prequel to the Menopause Mysteries series. This was a novella. All the other books in the series are full-length novels. The next book in the series is book one, A Midlife Catastrophe. When Nell Darling moves to a small Aussie mountain town after a messy divorce, she decides her life will be perfect. But life has decided to be no such thing. Nell discovers a body, buys a bookstore, and starts to suspect she is losing her mind. All because her new cat, Jennifer, likes to chat. Yet Nell has no time to pause and reflect. Soon she is chasing her tail to solve the murder. Hard on her heels is the dreamy Detective Caspian Cole, who seems to think Nell is mad for real. But it doesn't matter what Detective Cole thinks, because Nell is about to discover that menopause doesn't mean her life is put on pause. In fact, menopause is a sign that Nell's has finally begun. Literally a fun read for women who are coming into their power. You've just listened to But Wait, There's Murr. Menopause Mysteries Prequel, written by Morgana Best, narrated by Amy Soakes. Copyright 2021 by Morgana Best. Production Copyright 2021 by Morgana Best. Thanks for listening.